Hey traders, David Frost, my strategic forecast. You're here for a weekend update for the week ending December 3, 2021. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. What do we have on the docket today? What we have on the docket is a couple of things. What my intentions are is to review a couple of different schematics that may take place over the next few weeks. I'm going to give you the reasoning behind both scenarios, and what it's going to do is give us what to watch out for. If the market's doing A, we have a pretty good idea of why and how long it may last. If the market is doing B, we have a pretty good idea of where it's going and then what's going to happen. So what we're going to do here is lay out schematic A and schematic B. Let's set the table for schematic number one. On the fourth, today, Saturday, there was a total solar eclipse. Now, we're going to call that tinfoil hat event 2.0. The last tinfoil event we had was right in here. Now, it didn't immediately shift the market, but we can see a shift. Now, whether that was the reason or not doesn't matter. Whether it's an excuse or not doesn't matter. We're just going with things can happen around those events. They don't have to happen. We're not making trades based on the fact that they might happen. We're just aware of them because if they do do something material, we have an idea of what's going to happen next, and I'll get to that in a moment. As an example, look at a 15-minute chart from Friday. In the last 15-minute candle of the day, the market ran up like a bat out of hell. Why is that? Well, we can attribute it to the trick, trap, fool, and frustrate crew. That's number one. Maybe it was the 449.75. We've seen that on the chart before. We'll get back to that later. But maybe, just maybe, it was buyers in anticipation of a shift in trend from at least a short-term basis because of the tinfoil hat event number two. If that's the case, we're back to the daily chart. If that's the case... We can expect the market to have some kind of a relief rally from the recent sell-off from the recent highs. We could say that Monday would be on time. Now, let's look at it this way. The market's job is to make as many traders and investors feel like fools as much of the time as possible. You'll hear plenty of things like, it was a buying opportunity, you have to buy for the next leg higher, all that stuff will come out of the talking heads in the media. But essentially, what's likely to happen if they do rally for, let's just say, a week or two or maybe even longer, and when I say rally for a period of time, it doesn't mean the market's up every day. It doesn't mean they have to make new highs. It just means you have a relief rally and they found a low for a while. They'll go up, they'll come back to retest, they'll go up again. That's the way it works. But if they do that, what they're really doing is they're sucking the bulls back into the market, making everybody believe the sell-off or correction is over, everybody goes back in, and then what happens? They hit it again. If we just want to think of it in terms of waves, and I'm not saying Elliott waves, I'm just saying waves. So wave one is here, maybe wave two will be like this, and then all of a sudden, boom, wave three, they hit it again. Is that reminiscent of an A, B, C? Well, yeah. So what we're saying here is, maybe this is one, and one doesn't have to end on Friday. That's second thing. We'll get to that in a few moments. Maybe wave two goes up like this, and it's not going to go straight up, but it goes up and back and forth, and it goes up and back and forth. And then what happens is you find it up here, and all of a sudden, everybody's ultra bullish. We're going to make new highs. And before you know it, they hit it again. That's really schematic plus the reasoning behind 1.0. Now, let's talk about the other side of that. Let's say the tinfoil hat event has no effect, or it has what we call an acceleration effect. So not only does the market shift in the other direction, within some of these events or as a result of some of these events, but also it could have an acceleration effect and therefore we could see another leg down and then we would be talking about some lower numbers, not always or necessarily the 435 and a half. It could be shorter than that. Could be this gap up here, could be another spot. I have other numbers, but this was the oh boy number. If they're actually killing the tape, cutting through everything, Where would they be going? 
that is a likely spot. And here's what else we'll say about that. That spot's coming one way or the other. Whether they rally for a little while first and then hit them again, put in some kind of a bearish, wedgish, bearish, flaggish kind of pattern, that's very possible. How important that spot is will determine how they get there. Maybe they hover over it for a while, that will change things. If they come straight into it or close to it, that's going to be a lot of support in and around that area. Could be off by a dollar, could be off by a dollar and a half. But what I will say is, while that is a gap, that line is there for a different reason. That's an area that came from another type of, we'll call it, mathematical rendition. And it somewhat coincided with a gap. It's not equal or exact to the penny. It's close enough. So we look at the gap. I'll give you an example, and you might want to get out your sticky note for this one. 438 and a half is also an important number. I didn't put it up on the screen. Inside the number members will have that number when the time comes that they need it. And by the way, the other schematic, number two, really comes from the same stuff. It's just, what are they going to do first? Are they going to rally first, or are they going to kill them first? And if they kill them first, we're still looking at that same zone. Now, I'm not saying that same zone around 435 or so is going to be hit in short order like Monday or Tuesday if they kill the tape. It could, but that's not what we're saying. We're just saying that I would be interested in that spot for two reasons. A, if they started getting below the 100 period moving average, 447 in that neighborhood, then that number becomes more of a reality and number two, if they get to that number sooner than later, you're likely to get a pretty big bounce away back up north from that number. Let's talk about another number, about 449.75. Now look what happens here. So on the 1st of December, the low is 450.29. They miss it. The next day, on the 2nd, the low is 450.31. They didn't get it again. The third day, they hit the number, spike through by a little bit, and bounce away. Here's an hourly chart. It's kind of interesting how they did the dance around that number. So here's what I want to point out. If you take the low here, it, this is the low, not this. So the low here is 450.29. And you take the low here when they missed it again. And that low is 450.13. And then you take the low from Friday, which is 448.92. They spiked it a little bit. That's normal garden variety behavior. But if you take those three numbers average them, what do you come out with? How about 449.78? There's nothing we can do with that information. I just find the numbers, numerology, how this stuff works, really, really interesting. They come up short, they come up short, they spike it through, and all of a sudden, those three numbers average three pennies above my number. Now think about this for a second. If they hit the number back here on the first, look at the tremendous bounce away you got from that. Now, the fact that they hit it later in the day on Friday prevents at least me from taking that trade at that number while they're killing the tape into a Friday afternoon. Later in the day, in that kind of scenario, you're really in an anything-goes scenario. If you take a trade, you don't have enough time, and you're going to end up holding something over the weekend or taking a loss on the trade if it doesn't bounce back right away. So you really need enough time on the clock to take a trade like that at a price like that. Still goes to show you it was important. Whether it was 450 on the nose, the big fat round number, my number was slightly below. I just find it interesting nonetheless. The other thing that happened, let's go through everything. So essentially they really did come into a former breakout area. That's right here. And they did bounce up. They did close above it. In addition to that, they closed above the 50 period moving average. There are no accidents or coincidences. Look at this. The 50 period moving average is 453.31. The closing price is 453.42. Just to prove a point, last minute of the day, this is a one minute chart. The market ran down to a low of 453.21, but closed back above also that 50 period moving average. No accidents or coincidences in the market. I'll give you another one while we're here. Big breakup candle. One minute chart. The low, 449.82. Here's the low of this candle. How about 449.81? They run a test of a breakup candle low and take off to the upside relentlessly into the close. 
easy trade. Just kidding. By the way, just to answer a quick question, because I know what some of you were thinking. Well, I'll just pull up a one-minute chart and do that. Well, that doesn't work all the time, because another chart might be, as I say, in operation. What if they're in the process of running a test of a breakup candle low on a 15-minute chart, or a 30-minute chart, or a 60-minute chart, and it's far away from that breakup candle low on one-minute chart, they're not going to stop there, and that's why it's not that easy. You have to know which chart is the operable chart, and you're not always going to know that. You're trying to figure it out on a consistent basis, or at least I am. Now, because this is a weekend video, we're going to take a little bit of a different turn in this video, and we'll get back to the norm on Monday. But what I want to do here is take a look at some of the wider held stocks, see what they're doing. Let's check in with their charts to see if they're telling us anything material. We'll start with Amazon. So from a daily chart perspective, came down with everything else, came into all the moving averages, bounced off of it, closed above this breakup candle low, but there's nothing definitive on this daily chart to say, hey, it's going to bounce up from here or it's going to continue lower. Either way, both scenarios are on the table. Time is more important than price into the moving averages. On time, holds a breakup candle low. I would favor the bull case, if any. If Friday's candle looked differently, I might start to call it a full stack. And when you flip over to the weekly chart, you see what happened. They came into the 50-week moving average. That's an important spot. There's a lot of support in here. However, 3285, 3280, 3290 in that neighborhood is a much better location to find some kind of a better low, in my opinion. How about Apple? Apple's a darling. So Apple's above all the moving averages, but they have a nice little reversal candle from a couple of days ago. A, can Apple be traded against the high on the short side? If a trader must, the answer is yes. Your risk reward is closing daily above that high, and therefore you'd have to exit the trade. I'm not a favored fan of shorting the widest held stock in the market. Some traders like to do that. I don't like to fight the trend. And I don't mean just the trend on the chart. The trend is people want to own Apple. People love Apple. There's Appaloonians. I don't want to fight that stuff. Besides, it's still technically in an uptrend. And what do we say about the trend? She's your friend until she hacks your iPhone. Now we go over to the weekly chart, and sure, we're above all the moving averages, but guess what? On volume, she puts in a weekly tail candle. How you doing? Same high number, 170.30 is the number. And if Apple's going to come down, it's going to start from somewhere. And here, and this is what I always preach, you need to have something to trade against when stocks are at an all-time high. You don't have a point of reference. Same thing with a low. So you wait for a sign and or signal of a trend change. This would be one of them. There's plenty more. Sometimes you get multiple on the same stock on a variety of different charts. Here, you have a sign and or signal. That's the story on Apple. Monthly chart on Apple, not so much. Technically, there's nothing wrong with the monthly chart. You're in the month of December. This is the December candle. You have no idea what's going to happen in the month of December by the end. And therefore, this is just still in an uptrend. Nothing wrong whatsoever. You treat each chart independent of one another. From a monthly chart perspective, if you're looking for a shift in trend, then look at something like this, where you have this tremendous volume here, and you can see the stock made a low, it took off, it never looked back. That was the shift. You don't have anything like that since then, so there's nothing material changing on the monthly chart. How about Facebook? Facebook's melting away a little bit, still 300 bucks a share, but look where it was. It was at 385 or whatever it was not too long ago. Daily chart, below all the moving averages, the trend is your friend, the trend here is down. We're in a sell-the-rip environment until or unless the trend changes back up. That goes for a variety of different stocks. It goes for the major markets, depending on what chart you're looking at. If the trend is down, we're in a sell-the-rip environment. On the daily chart of the S&P, we're in the sell-the-rip environment. 
You just have to pick your spots. That doesn't mean you sell the market on every single rally. It's just a concept of sell the rip rather than buy the dip. Both will work if your time and price are on the mark. Weekly chart. So let me point a couple of things out. A, it's a very negative close for Facebook closing below the 50 period moving average on the week. They just hit it and bounced off of it. Now to come right back just a few days later and give it up, that's a very negative sign. We also have this spot over here to the left where this is really important, right? This is where the market ran up to and was rejected, tried it again, failed, but finally busted through. So what happens, this becomes a breakout area. Now, maybe they've just come back down to retest a breakout area and that's going to be the end of it. That's fine. If the market's going to get some kind of a relief rally for several days, a week, two weeks, then Facebook will certainly participate. For me, I can't help but notice this here came up short of that area, bounced away, and now they came into that area. Had every excuse to come down to that zone before, didn't do it, now they're here. Maybe they bounce for a while, but still, this is a negative tape at present in Facebook. We talk about monthly charts, they take a long time to play out. Here's a monthly chart that turned quite a while ago. Just as a point of reference, and we'll get back to the cues later, here's a monthly chart of the cues. This is the first month that they're down since they made a tail or topping tail in the month of November. So what's really happening here, and this is the way you have to look at it, where's the money flow going? In Facebook, the money flow for the last few months has been out of Facebook. Forget the news, it doesn't matter what the excuse is, the money flow is all that drives the price. Money is either flowing into a stock or it's flowing out of a stock. Just interesting to know where Facebook is relative to the Qs and the Dow and the S&P. And this is what's called institutional distribution. They're selling the stock and have been for quite a while. How about Mickey Soft? Down with everything else on the daily chart, but there's really nothing wrong with the daily chart. They go up, they make a new high, they pull back a little bit. This is garden variety market behavior. As long as they're above the 50-day moving average, technically there's nothing wrong with Microsoft. Supported by the fact that when you look at the weekly chart, they're well above all the moving averages. Maybe they're coming in to run a test of the 20-week moving average, break up candle low. Sounds like a great spot right around 300 and change. You want to talk about a full stack. If I draw a line from the last time Microsoft made a high and pulled back, coincides with this breakup candle low, coincides with the 20-week moving average. So from an intra-week perspective, and this is kind of how you uncover things that make sense. Remember, this is common sense market analysis. So let's look at some numbers. Let's do this one in real time. The breakup candle low is around 306 and a half. This pivot high is around 305.84. It's the same number. It's around 306. The 20 period moving average is slightly above. Remember, this is a weekly chart. So let's just say intra week, they came down and they spiked through the weekly period 20 moving average. That's fine. That's normal garden variety behavior. Closing a week below or above it is what really counts. Spiking it is normal. Then you also are close to a big fat round number of 300. So now let's just pick out 300 and just say to ourselves, if Microsoft came down within, let's say, the next several days, if there were more selling pressure in Microsoft and they came into around 300, should there be garden variety of support if they can even get to 300? And you flip back to the daily chart and you say, well, here's a 50 period moving average. If they came down farther with any kind of velocity around 305, which is around that same area that we've just been discussing, the 306, the breakup candle low, the last time it ran up to here, it's all 306, so you're in the same ballpark. Here's a gap down here. What's the gap? 296.31. There's a couple of different ways to look at this, so I'm going to give you the way I'm looking at this. Where price is today? Let's say they came down toward 300. We're just doing the hypothetical exercise, but this is the mindset of how this stuff works. Not all the time are they going to come into and spike through 300. Sometimes they'll come up short, 303, 304, 305, 301, 
and they fake everybody out. They never get the 300. It's kind of like coming up short of a gap. They bounce away, and then they come back to it later, but they screw the people waiting for 300 on both sides. The ones who were short waiting to cover at 300, the ones waiting to buy at 300. So both factions of traders get screwed when they do that. So if they were going to do that, and you know I'm going here, if they were going to do that, what's the number? There's two. You're going to write these down. We're going to track it for fun, see what happens. If the thing bounces away and doesn't come back for a while, it's not going to matter. But we'll just see what happens as a just-in-case, or we'll leave it on the chart for a while and see if we can remember to check back with Mickey Soft. 302.75, 300.39. Both are coming up short of the big fat round number. If they come through the big fat round number, you look to the gap right here, 296.31. So somewhere in that neighborhood is where they should catch the tape. They may not come into 300 for six weeks. Who knows? Likewise, how about six months? Who knows? How about Google, Alphabet? Google L is the one we're looking at. There's another one, G-O-O-G. I don't really know the difference between the two. Different kinds of stocks. Same stuff. Daily chart. Not too bad. They're hovering around the 50 period moving average, the 100. Everything's kind of bunched up in here. They found support at the breakup candle low. But what's really going on is unless they get going and rally back above the 20 period moving average, just say 3,000, 2,950, 29 and a quarter in that neighborhood, unless they rally back up there, then they're really putting in one of these bearish kind of patterns and the breakup candle low is going to give way and they're going to come lower. From a weekly chart perspective, the trend is your friend. But watch that 20-week moving average. If they give up the ghost and give up this breakup candle low here at 2708 and change, then look out Irene. But that's not what's happening now. We treat each chart independent of one another. This is not really a chart that has a ton of institutional distribution. You had one down week, and that's really it. What about the bank stocks? Now, we look at the XLF, but maybe we'll look at a couple of individual stocks like Bank of America. So they fill this gap down here. It was already filled, apparently. But they're doing the same thing. They're hovering. They're making a bearish kind of flaggish kind of thing under these moving averages. Now, note this. You've got a 20-period moving average that's about to cross over the 50. So that trend is changing. It really has changed being above the 100 and 200, but below the 20 and the 50. So you're really in a downtrend right now in terms of the daily chart. But in the weekly chart, you're first approaching the home base or 20-week moving average, which is also the same routine. So are they just coming back to run a test? Here's a 20-week moving average. Here's a former breakout area. The market ran up, rejected, ran up, finally broke out, coming back to run a test, coinciding with a 20-week moving average. So you have to be careful. If you think the market's just going to collapse out of nowhere, they're going to pull the rug out, open the trap door, and everybody short makes a ton of money. That's not the way it works. It's hard to kill a bull. From a weekly chart perspective, this isn't an uptrend. You have money managers that are plenty willing to buy the 20-week moving average. They're not looking at the news. It's automatic buying. Could also make a case that the Bank of America weekly chart is really coming into a full stack situation. Keeping on, keeping on. The monthly chart. So you have a big breakup candle low. The low happens to be at 42.33. So let's just do another exercise. We'll say 42.50 for argument's sake, and then we'll let's backtrack. Weekly chart spike through the 20-week moving average, 42.50, give or take, seems like a good spot. Still have the characteristics of the run-up and then the breakout above and the comeback to test, kind of spike through the 20-week moving average, go a little bit lower than the breakout area, same thing that happened to the SPY by chance, and they still closed above it by Friday, didn't they? Then you come over to the daily chart and you have a 100 period moving average there around that same spot. So all of a sudden you start to see why on a variety of different charts, there should be garden variety of chart support around 4250, 42, somewhere in that neighborhood for Bank of America. Put that on a sticky note. I realize this video is getting a little stretched, so we'll get back to the indices. Take a look at Camp IWM, what's going on over there. So it's same routine as the other markets, only this one is worse. They're leading the charge on the downside. 
what you had in the IWM is a bona fide failed breakout. I mean, there's your failed breakout. So the market goes sideways for a long, long time. We talked about this one for a long, long time. And then all of a sudden, it was breaking out. Big breakup candle low, gave it up. Closed below it immediately, right into the moving averages, and then gave up the moving averages. So can they bounce back up to try and recapture the moving averages? That's naturally what will happen at some point in time. Whether or not they go slightly lower first, they will try and fight back at some point to that convergence of moving averages right around, oh, by the way, a big fat round number of two and a quarter. But if you just looked at this market and compared to the other ones and take into consideration what I say all the time, this is my favorite market leading indicator. Why is that? Because it works as a leading indicator. Unless they recapture those moving averages on a weekly basis, there's trouble in the IWM, and the IWM is not going to go down and have the other markets go up. That's not the way this works. It's all the same market. They're all going to go down together. They all go up together, not necessarily to the same magnitude. And yeah, there's anomaly days here and there. But for the most part, that's what happens. Back to the daily chart, are they going to try and rally back to recapture or at least run a test of the convergence of the last two moving averages in this sequence, the 200 and the 100? And the answer is absolutely they are. And while they're doing that, and think about this for a second, they're about 10 points away. 10 points is a long way in the IWM. So in the process of going back up to those moving averages, maybe through them, maybe try for the 50 period moving average, maybe get all the way to fill this gap. Guess what? You go fill this gap. What is that? It's about halfway home. Guess what? That's garden variety. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but if it does happen, it's still part of the way the market works. And regardless of where they're going, if they're bouncing up to these moving averages or fill the gap, while that's happening, everything is bullish. Everything is fine. You're thinking that everything is fine because that's what they're telling you. So guess what? The bulls come out of the woodwork, buy the market, we're going to make new highs, 2022 is going to be fantastic. All that stuff on up days will be said by the talking heads. That's the way it works. The market influences the conversation, obviously. But this is what's not obvious. The conversation influences what you do. Even though you watch the videos, you hear the numbers, you see the numbers, you know the numbers, you're still going to be influenced by the folks on TV. That's just the way it works until you tune them out. Why do you tune them out? Because they don't know anything. Out of a hundred people they parade on TV, three know something. 97 know shit. Let me give you an example. This is true as the day is long. The other day, the folks over at CNBC paraded somebody out to talk about exchange-traded funds. She was a CEO of a fund company. Doesn't matter how big it was, how small it was, or even what the name was. Here's my point. She was young, so a couple of things occurred to me. A, let's find out where else she's been, and B, she's never seen a bear market. She doesn't even know what it looks like. But go with me on this. So I look her up. I go to her LinkedIn profile, and I find out about five years ago, she wasn't even in the financial services business. Now she's the CEO of an exchange-traded fund company of some sort. Come on. No offense, but this is like the 23-year-old telling you what crypto to buy. He doesn't understand, or she doesn't understand, they're going to be wiped out. 90% of these crypto things are going to be worthless because they already are worthless. 10% will succeed. It's a carbon copy of the dot-com bubble. Even though it doesn't feel like it, you can disagree. This is the way it works. Folks down at the transportation department, I know we don't look at this chart anymore. It's skewed, but it doesn't matter. We're going to look at it anyway because what I have to say has really nothing to do with the chart. What I have to say about the folks down here at the transportation department is look at yesterday and then look at Thursday. So you have Thursday as an up day, Friday as not a down day. They scratched out a little bit of a gain. My second favorite market leading indicator, A number one canary in the coal mine. 50 period moving average, bounced off of it. You go back to something we talked about earlier in the video, tinfoil hat event over the weekend. Maybe there's a trend change. Maybe they bounced the market for a little bit. Were the transports signaling ahead? 
Maybe so. Here's the IYT. Now, it was down a little bit, one-third of 1%, but the S&P was down eight-tenths or almost nine-tenths of 1%, so still outpacing or outperforming the S&P. It's interesting. What about the Q people, the folks out in Silicon Valley? Check this out. So 382.78 was a number we've had on here for a long, long time. What does that represent? It represents them running up to this area, the same thing we keep talking about, this area, and getting rejected. Well, guess what? They came back to run a test, and look where the closing price was based on where they were intraday. They closed at 383.13, above that number, after being below it, spiking through the 50-period moving average all in the same day, but closing back above it. That's interesting. We got an on-time scenario. We got a run a test of a former breakout area, 50-period moving average, it makes sense that they would bounce the tape. Here's the SPX, this is the cash index. Just what I want to point out, number of points. So I brought up this index for no reason whatsoever. The low here is 4503.97, 4504. The high here is 4541. So we're gonna round it and say, they ran the thing up about 40 points in a few minutes, 40 points. That's not running it up 10 or 12 points into the close. They do that kind of stuff all the time. 40 points is different. Computers can run up 10 points. 40 points means something different was going on into the close. So I'm really building the story around support for tinfoil hat event 2.0, a couple of full stack situations, or what appear to be full stack situations, the run up into the close, and I'm saying expect a bounce. It's not guaranteed. If they kill the tape, we got numbers on the downside, that's fine. But don't be surprised if they start bouncing the tape, they start talking bullish, and that becomes or morphs into several days to even a week or two. By the way, while we're here, let me mention something on the trade. This is for lazy swing trader folks. So 399.80 was the entry on the short side for the Qs. Now I'm talking about them bouncing the tape. Why didn't they take profit? Well, because we kind of got lucky. I didn't know they were going to drop the thing immediately. And really the intention was, or my original thinking was, this is the day we bought it right here, and they immediately dropped the tape. But if they were going to go sideways like this, and a little bit higher, I was going to add some. So what we're going to do is, if they bounce the tape, I'm still going to add, regardless of where they bounce it to. We'll see what happens and determine where and how much and all that stuff later. But the point is, I'm still going to add to it, the important thing right now is we have a pretty good head start on the trade. And by the way, any trader that wants to take profit and re-engage later, that's up to you. Obviously, you're welcome to do that. Nobody ever got fired for taking a profit. Nobody ever went broke taking a profit. XLF, we talked about the financials a little bit with Bank of America, but guess what? They're hovering around the 100 period moving average. The last line of defense is the 200, and guess what? The 200 isn't what it once was. Why is that? If they came into it here, that's one thing. But now they're eating time off the clock right over it. So they're either going to bounce up and try and run a test up here and recapture this, or they're going to go lower, and I wouldn't necessarily buy the 200 here with this setup at present. By the way, interestingly enough, that breakup candle we looked at on Bank of America is a little bit different position, or at least... XLF is in a different position relative to that. So they already ran a test of that breakup candle low. So getting below this, this is a monthly chart, so it's all month long, but getting below this is interesting. That would be a flare up in the air. Smash Mouth, they're hovering around a big fat round number, 300. They're about to give up the 20 period moving average unless there's a rescue operation, as I like to call it. And with this one, we could say that last week was a reversal week, but the trend is your friend until she throws your shit out the window. Look how far up this thing is above all the moving averages. So on this one, we're talking about if it came down, they're just going to come down to run a test of home base first, break up candle low, home base, breakout area, that whole nine yards. There's a full stack down there, but you're nowhere near that price. The SMH is in a totally different position than almost every other market. And... Have I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you? Without you, these videos are not possible. That is true and accurate information. We're going to pull the ripcord here. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. 
Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.